She didn't know about Scott and Lacey missing until her friend told her, hey, that guy you brought to the Christmas party, he's on TV every day. And so I went to the other room and called the Modesto Police Department hotline that they had. I was in shock. I mean, I literally was in shock. I'm standing behind our clerk, and she's typing, and I'm watching, and it's, uh, Scott Peterson is my boyfriend. Uh, we've been dating exclusively. He said he wasn't married, and I'm like, Bev, is, is that lady on the phone? Yeah, and so I talked to her, and it was Amber Fry, and... Couldn't get any words out for a while. And I was like, it, it is him. Like, it, this is him. I'm like, okay, don't go nowhere. <laughs> I'm gonna come visit you right now. Amber Fry started cooperating with police as soon as she learned that the man of her dreams was really a married man whose wife had disappeared and he had been lying to her all along. I buy her a tape recorder with some cassette tapes and a wire that can hook onto her phone. And I tell her, okay, if he ever calls, just push these two buttons and just talk normal. The phone rings, and it's Scott Peterson. I'm like, that's him. <laughs> Showtime, girl. Amber. Hey, happy New Year. Happy New Year. I wanted to call you. Thank you. What they heard on December 31st, 2002, was a Scott Peterson who, while a candlelight vigil is being held for his missing wife, and he's attending it, is also on the phone with Amber Fry, being recorded unbeknownst to him, telling her that he's in Europe. I'm uh, near the Eiffel Tower. New Year's celebration is unreal. The, the crowd is huge. The crowd's huge? He was right down the street where the vigil was taking place. At the end of our last episode, Scott Peterson told a morbid tale about his missing wife, Lacey, that made his own sister reconsider whether or not he truly was a monster. The picture Scott painted of a grieving Lacey encompassed by dead children shook his half-sister Ann Bird to the core, leaving her with the impression that her little brother might be trying to tell her something. It was mid-March when Scott shared his macabre story with Anne. At that point, his pregnant wife had been missing for 11 long weeks. Their son was due over a month before, and Scott knew as well as Anne did that the outlook on their status was grim. It was an odd time for him to describe his tearful wife in a shadowy cemetery full of departed children, causing Anne to pick up on something sinister as he shared his untimely tale believing it to be a veiled confession to murder. Although she acknowledged her imagination may have warped her perception of Scott's creepy story a bit, she felt certain after hearing it that she'd never see Lacey again. But if Anne thought his cemetery story contained a confession to familicide, you never would have known it as she and Scott carried on over the following weeks. It seems she put his dark message in the back of her mind as he continued to drop by for frequent visits and slept over in her loft as often as ever. Anne's husband Tim remained less than thrilled with the arrangement, especially after Scott popped in unannounced on Tim's birthday to flirt with their babysitter, leaving he and Anne both shocked at his behavior. Scott was introduced to their beautiful babysitter once before, only briefly, but it seems the young, attractive woman left a lasting impression. Scott called Anne on the 21st of March to see what she had planned for Tim's birthday. She only had to mention Lorraine being at the house for Scott to make a beeline to the bird's place in Berkeley. And true to form, he didn't arrive empty-handed. Armed with a bottle of schnapps and a beaming, carefree smile, Scott laid on the charm with Lorraine, mixing up cocktails called flirtinis and doing all he could to appear 10 years younger and single. 22-year-old Lorraine stayed for a while, finishing off two of Scott's flirtinis and seeming to like the attention, 
at first. But Scott came on too strong, and by the end of that second drink, the young beauty was overwhelmed and ready to go. Anne walked Lorraine to her car, but once the two were outside, the younger woman stopped. She leaned in closely to Anne and said, Your brother's a hottie, but my God. Lorraine asked Anne to pass along one last happy birthday wish to Tim before eagerly heading home to her boyfriend. Lorraine was not only eight years younger than Scott, but already spoken for, not to mention being soured to his personality in record time. However, none of that stopped him from telling his mother about her. And if Lorraine thought Scott was a bit much, we can only imagine how she felt after her first chat with Jackie. Jackie Peterson called to speak to Anne the day after Tim's birthday, disappointed to find she was out running errands but she perked up a bit after hearing Lorraine on the line instead. Based on what she'd heard from Scott, Jackie thought Lorraine would make a great match for her golden boy, and apparently she felt this was as good a time as any to let the young woman know. She told Lorraine how perfect she was for her son and how she wished Scott could find a nice girl just like her. Needless to say, Jackie's comments made Lorraine immensely uncomfortable and she shared them with Anne, who found it hard to believe what she was hearing. Of course, Anne didn't believe Lorraine would lie, but still struggled to make sense of Jackie's remarks. Unsure what to think, Anne remained neutral, assuming there was a misunderstanding somewhere between them. But it wouldn't be long until she heard something very similar from Jackie herself. How was Tim's birthday? Jackie asked when she called later that day. It could have been better, Anne said, recalling that they'd eaten leftovers with Scott and went to bed depressed. Scott called me yesterday when he was on his way over. He said your sitter was there, Jackie continued sweetly. He told me a while ago that she's really cute. She is cute, said Anne. She's also 22 years old and has a boyfriend. Jackie sighed and said, I wish Scott would meet someone like Lorraine. What? Anne exclaimed. What did you just say? Even hearing it with her own ears, Anne couldn't believe it. Still stunned as Jackie began speaking again, Anne heard her ask, When you see Scott, have him call me, will you? Before hanging up the phone. According to Anne Bird, that conversation took place on the 22nd of March. However, the sentiment from Jackie Peterson contrasts greatly with the statements she made about Lacey just one month before. On the 19th of February, Jackie sat for an interview with Greta Van Susteren, during which she made the following statements about her daughter-in-law. She's wonderful. She's like the sparkle in the family. We all just couldn't wait for her to come and be around us, and we visited her as often as we could. She's just a delight, and everyone loved her. The grandkids are nuts about her. The siblings adore her. She just makes everything wonderful for people. She's the nicest person you'd ever want to meet. Of course, this was after Greta let in with some hard questions about Scott, but Jackie held her own during the interview. She not only doled out her usual declaration of innocence based on her son's good heart and kind nature, but also added in a dash of skepticism surrounding the investigation. Jackie questioned whether the Modesto PD was following up on important leads, specifically mentioning the trail picked up by scent dogs Merlin and Trimble, saying, quote, In the beginning, there was the dog found with his leash, and their hound dogs found that she had gotten into a car in the middle of the street, and they followed the scent out to a rural area, out of town and people have lost sight of that total picture." End quote. This statement from Jackie came just one day after Scott called the lead detective on the case, Craig Grogan, with some grievances of his own. On February 18th, Scott voiced concerns after being denied the opportunity to view surveillance footage captured in Longview, Washington. He was frustrated after learning a potential sighting of Lacey had been caught on camera and police wouldn't let him watch the tape. The tip had been called in weeks before, at the end of January, 
with the actual incident occurring a month prior to that, meaning the sighting itself occurred not long after Lacey's disappearance. On the 23rd of January, the Longview, Washington Police Department received a call from Susan Anderson, a clerk at a local market called Sinnott's. Susan called to report an unusual encounter she had with a couple in the store roughly one month before. One evening, a young pregnant woman came in with a much older man, and Anderson thought it was odd that she wasn't wearing a coat. The temperature had barely reached 40 degrees in Longview that day. So as the woman approached the counter, Anderson said, You know, you should put a coat on. It's cold outside. After shooting a quick glance toward the older man, who was now at the back of the store, the woman stepped closer and replied, I can't really. I'm being kidnapped and the guy has a weapon. You should call the police when I leave. Just then, the ruddy-faced older man returned, taking the pregnant woman by the arm and asking Anderson what the two of them had been talking about. Perhaps thinking it was a joke, Susan Anderson responded with the truth, saying, well, she said she was kidnapped. The man's reaction was far from amused. Anger had twisted his face in an instant, but the woman was already speaking by the time it settled there. With her arms still firmly in his grasp, she quickly replied, yeah, my husband kidnaps me all the time. It's very, you know, romantic. With that, the man's ruddy face relaxed, and he even let out a laugh as the couple left the market, leaving Susan Anderson unsure about what she'd just witnessed. The incident slipped her mind as the market got busy, and after she finished her shift that day and several more after, the pregnant woman was all but forgotten. Until late January, when Susan Anderson saw Lacey's photo on the news. Scott learned the details about Susan Anderson's tip from Fox News reporter Rita Crosby. He became frustrated with lead detective Grogan after being denied permission to view the surveillance footage of the incident. Scott called Grogan, irritated by his plan to have strangers determine if Lacey was in the footage rather than have her family offer an opinion. It was during that same call that he criticized their release of photos of his truck and boat early on in the investigation, as police made a plea for the public to help verify his fishing alibi. Scott was again frustrated knowing the police had witnesses and his boat launch receipt to prove he was at the marina on the 24th. He felt the public plea did nothing but cast undue suspicion on him. Chief was stuck fishing by himself. Or was it good we're not gonna, we're not gonna discuss that at this point. Probably viewers would find it odd that you you can't explain what the, the husband is doing fishing. Well, let me let me just let me yeah let me kind of just put that all to rest. It would be wrong for me to speculate. I don't understand what you're talking about speculating. You mean whether he was actually fishing or not? Um, we're just uh, yes. It would be wrong for me to speculate. Scott's final complaint was very similar to the grievance his mother shared with Greta on Fox News the following day, condemning investigators for spending so much time focused on him rather than following up on other promising leads. It seems Scott and Jackie had both become more vocal with their criticisms of police as February drew to an end, and it wouldn't be long before they received a powerful response from Detective Grogan himself. However, Amber Fry's reaction was much swifter. After taking Detective John Bueller's advice the day before, Amber finally broke things off with Scott. Mostly. Though the National Enquirer would continue to claim that their phone conversations continued up until Scott's arrest, Amber's last official call to Scott Peterson was placed at 7.36 a.m. on the 19th of February. They spoke for less than three minutes, just long enough for Amber to say that they shouldn't speak again without a resolution in Lacey's case and for Scott to agree immediately. However, while their phone conversations ceased on the 19th of February, 
Amber and Scott continued to exchange emails through early April, leaving her new boyfriend, Dave Markovich, frustrated for six more long weeks. During the first week of April, Amber got at least two emails from Scott. On the third, he wrote about flying kites with his nephews, and he sent another message on the eighth about volunteering to help build a battered women's shelter in Modesto. It's unknown how many total messages the two of them shared, but detectives didn't read them until June of that year, at the same time prosecutor Dave Harris received them. However, Dave Markovich, Amber's boyfriend, was well aware she was still messaging Scott. He'd grown increasingly frustrated throughout March and April as the emails continued. Even though Amber tried to assure Dave, she didn't reply to Scott's messages too often. By the time Amber recorded her final call with Scott in late February, Sharon and Brent Rocha were grasping at straws with their searches for Lacey, growing more desperate and discouraged by the minute. After a fruitless day searching the marshes in Antioch, drawn there by a psychic tip and a lie Scott told Amber about duck hunting, Sharon and Brent took the long way home to look down Covina Avenue. Lacey would have been horrified to see the lines of media trucks and reporters on the lawns, and it saddened Sharon to see her daughter's home become a spectacle for the world to gawk at. She hadn't yet made it to her own home nearby before she was calling Scott, compelled to ask again if she could have some of her daughter's things from the house. He instantly told her no, that he was no longer willing to give her Lacey's things. Scott told Sharon in an email days before that he didn't want her to take Lacey's Tiffany lamps. His wife would want to see them in their house undisturbed when she came home, but he was fine parting with the sentimental items Sharon wanted, such as Lacey's cheerleading outfit, her photo albums, and some of Connor's baby clothes. But now Scott said Sharon could take nothing. He began yelling at her. You're looking for a body. You think Lacey is dead. She was eventually able to calm him down, explaining that she needed some pieces of her daughter and her grandson to hold on to in order to come to grips with their loss, feeling them slip further and further away from her grasp with each passing day. Scott finally agreed to meet Sharon at the house, but when it came time to gather Lacey's things, he called her off at the last minute. He told her police were still working their search warrant and he wouldn't be there to let her in by the time they were done. Sharon suggested Detective Grogan could meet her there and lock up after. In fact, all the better, she didn't have to see Scott, though she kept that last thought to herself. He agreed, and they set a time for Grogan to walk Sharon through the house the following day, after police concluded their search. While comforted a bit, knowing she would soon have at least a small piece of Lacey and Connor close to her, Sharon was still nearly broken by her grief. She and her son Brent searched through acres of marshland for Lacey's body that day, growing more desperate to bring her home with every step, but consistently terrified that she would be the one to find her. As the light began to fade, Sharon paused to consider the miles of wetlands stretched out before her. The expanse would have taken an army to explore properly. The vastness weighed heavily on her mind as she and Brent made their way back to the car. Sharon considered the magnitude and scale of the search for her daughter as they left Antioch that day, believing it would take a miracle to find Lacey. You get all this information from psychics or other people, you know, where they saw her, or um, they think they saw her, and for some reason there's always water involved. And when you go over to the Bay Area and you're looking at the water, there is a lot of water in this state. I remember driving one evening, looking up at the stars, thinking, this is a big, big world. Where could she be? She was exhausted by the time they saw the media trucks surrounding Lacey's house on the way home, but not too tired to make plans with Scott. Defeated and convinced she would likely never get Lacey back, Sharon rested in her bed, settling for keepsakes of Lacey and Connor as Scott gave her permission to go in the house the next evening. 
Still sick from a recent bout of the flu, Sharon rested while she waited out the clock on the 19th of February, expecting a call from Detective Grogan, but she heard from Scott first. Sharon didn't answer when he called, but lie in her bed and listened as his voice came through her answering machine. The police will be done in the house by 3 o'clock today, he said, but reporters are still swarming outside, and it's a bad time to try to come over. But if you want a sweatshirt of Lacey's or something, just let me know. Sharon tried to call and left messages for him a few times after that, but he never responded, and she didn't speak to Scott again until the end of his trial. This marked the 19th of February as the last day Scott spoke to either Amber Fry or Sharon Rocha, excluding Amber's emails, of course. Detective John Bueller drove to Fresno to collect the recording device Amber used, along with a few more tapes. But Bueller also picked up the birthday gifts she and Ayana received from Scott 10 days before. Detective Bueller wanted Amber to contact him before making her final call to Scott. He wanted to listen in as she broke things off with him, not knowing how he would react. But Amber made the call on her own, contacting Bueller after. As for Sharon, she eventually did go into the house for Lacey's things. Scott's permission be damned. To this day, she keeps a room full of her growing accumulation of artifacts and memories of Lacey, both good and bad. Lacey's cheerleading outfit from high school and her pregnancy diary for Connor lie alongside stacks of heartbreaking headlines and Sharon's notes from Scott's trial, documenting the layers of Lacey's nightmare and Sharon's struggle over the past 20 years. On the 5th of March, 2002, Lacey's case was reclassified as a homicide, which some suspected may have been an answer to the recent criticisms coming from the Petersons. Sharon stood alongside the rest of Lacey's family as lead detective Craig Grogan made the announcement, saying, quote, As the investigation has progressed, we have increasingly come to believe that Lacey Peterson is the victim of a violent crime. End quote. The reward from the Carol Sun Carrington Foundation dropped from $500,000 for Lacey's safe return to $50,000 for information leading to her remains. As detectives reclassified the case, local newspapers ran bold headlines, screaming Lacey's dead across the front page. Three weeks had passed since Sharon last spoke to Scott, and there'd still been no response to her messages. But now that Lacey was officially dead, she figured it was high time she tried to call her son-in-law. She knew he wouldn't answer, but she had her message ready for Scott. When the answering machine picked up, she screamed at him. Are you happy now? The big bold letters say Lacey is dead. Assuming he played that message, it was nearly the last thing Scott heard from Sharon before he was convicted of Lacey's murder. Though as we'll hear in our next episode, she would try to reach out to him one last time before then. On the 13th of March, Sharon was pulling out of the driveway after a visit with her sister Susie when she heard some news on the radio that caused her to jerk the gear shift back into park and dash inside. Elizabeth Smart has been found, Sharon told Susie excitedly. She's alive. Elizabeth Smart has been found alive, she exclaimed. Elizabeth Smart was 14 when she was abducted from her bedroom at Knife Point the summer before. In fact, she had been taken just days after Lacey learned she was pregnant with Connor. She was snatched from her bedroom and her miraculous homecoming nine months later gave hope to countless other families of missing children. Now, 20 years later, Elizabeth Smart is reflecting on her experience. March 12th marks the 20th anniversary of Elizabeth's rescue from her nightmare ordeal. Elizabeth Smart found alive today around 2 o'clock this afternoon in San... Kidnapped from her Utah home at age 14 and held captive by drifters Brian David Mitchell and his wife Wanda Barzi. But nine months later, she was miraculously rescued. 
Mitchell is behind bars, serving a life sentence. But Barzi was released from prison in 2018. Today, she's a free woman. I did everything I could to make sure she stayed in prison, but um, that is not what happened. She was released. Against all odds, Elizabeth has thrived. She's married with three children. How will you be marking this anniversary? Is it a celebration? I mean, March 12th is, is a happy day. It was, you know, it was the day I was rescued. It's a happy day. It was the 5th of June when Elizabeth vanished from Salt Lake City, Utah. And after no breaks in the case for nine months, nearly everyone involved in the search and investigation had given up hope. Everyone except for Elizabeth's mother, who made another desperate plea for her daughter's safe return in early March that led to Elizabeth being recognized, rescued, and returned home. The positive outcome was nothing short of a miracle, and the news was particularly encouraging for Sharon. The nine long months it took to find Elizabeth gave her hope that there was still a chance for Lacey and Connor. But more than that, Sharon thought there might be a direct connection between the strange couple arrested for Elizabeth's abduction and Lacey's disappearance on Christmas Eve. When she heard Brian Mitchell and Wanda Barzi were in the San Diego area over Christmas and that Barzi carried a doll with her as if it were a live baby, she sped home to tell Ron the news and to call Detective Grogan. Grogan had been expecting Sharon's call, knowing she would be excited about the possibility of a new lead but his voice was full of regret as he quickly stripped that hope away. There was no connection to Mitchell and Barzi. They'd already looked into it. Grogan sounded just as crushed as Sharon was when he broke the news, and the letdown after the smart case seemed to rob the last bit of hope from them both. The next major development in the search for Lacey would bring Sharon to her knees, and it would send Grogan on a manhunt for Scott. Lacey's older brother Brent and his wife Rose welcomed their second baby into the family in early April, a little boy. But the bright light of his joyous birth was heavily overshadowed by the tragic loss of his aunt and cousin months before. The family struggled to cope, knowing they would likely never bring Lacey and Connor back home, but the thought of her killer walking free was unbearable. The last search of the San Francisco Bay took place on the 29th of March. By then, Sharon was calling Grogan daily to ask about Scott's arrest warrant. Sometimes she would call twice a day, growing increasingly concerned that he would get away with Lacey's murder. But Grogan's response never changed. He told her they were building the case, gathering evidence, and not to worry, that they would bring Scott down. But in early April of 2003, Scott was still very much as free as he'd ever been. Now unemployed after his dismissal from trade court, Scott used his free time to take a road trip with his half-sister, Ann Bird. Ann planned to take her boys, Ryan and Tommy, to see their grandparents, Tom and Jerry Grady, in Point Loma near San Diego, and Scott decided to tag along. Anne must have simply been living in hope that the rest of the world was wrong about Scott's guilt as she kissed her sleeping husband Tim goodbye and loaded her small boys in the car with Scott to make the nine-hour trip south. Anne drove while Scott slept, along with Ryan and Tommy, but she hadn't been on the I-5 long when a dark thought crossed her mind. She was in a gas station restroom when she suddenly realized she'd left Scott in her car with the keys and her boys. The flash of doubt in her mind was enough to make her reconsider that decision, but not enough to derail the trip. Finding Scott and her boys still asleep when she returned, Anne got back on the road, continuing south when she drove into a storm. Scott was startled awake as the small car passed between two semis and the rain beat down on the highway. That was something to wake up to, he said relaxing his grip on the armrest as the trucks passed. Not long after that, he offered to drive, and with Scott at the wheel, they chatted about Brussels sprouts, irrigation, and the California drought as they rolled past the fields. Anne knew he was a fertilizer salesman, or used to be until recently, and she was impressed with his depth of knowledge about agriculture. 
Once they made it to Point Loma, she took him out drinking with her old friends, and of course, he stayed at the Grady's house with Anne, just like family. It wouldn't be until much later that Anne would point out several shady things Scott did during their visit. After dropping the boys off with her mother, Jerry, they headed straight for the Brigantine, a restaurant next to the yacht club in Point Loma and an old hangout of Anne's. She took Scott there knowing the place would be full of familiar faces, but deliberately left his last name out of her introductions to friends. But as Anne had to have already known, Scott had a familiar face by then too, and everyone at the Brigantine already knew who he was. Anne's friends warmed up to Scott well enough, or at least treated him like a normal guy for most of the night. After a round of drinks at the Brigantine, they traveled as a group to a Polynesian bar called the Bali High for another round, before moving on to a pub called the Ballast. There they shot pool and had several more rounds of drinks with Anne's friends, one of whom noticed the handful of pesos come out of Scott's pocket as he tried to pay for another drink. The friend, named Gordo, asked Scott if he was planning a trip to Mexico, but he ignored the question. A little while later, Gordo pulled Anne aside and said, You know, Annie, I really like you, and I don't want you to disappear. What? What's that supposed to mean? She asked. Gordo eventually told Anne about the pesos, but not until much later that night as they continued the party at his house. The group of them were plenty drunk and still drinking when Scott asked to use Gordo's computer, saying he wanted to see if the police had released his passport. With permission, Scott went to use the computer and left the room, but it was clear when he did that Gordo didn't trust Scott. Gordo told Anne about Scott's pocket full of pesos, and now he said he doubted very much that Scott could check his passport status online. But he also told her that he heard Scott use the past tense when talking about Lacey. Does that tell you anything? Gordo asked her sarcastically, giving her an incredulous look. No, Anne said. It doesn't tell me anything. Anne was tired of thinking about what Scott's behavior should or shouldn't tell her. Truth be told, that's why she was drunk, so she wouldn't have to think. And so far as she knew, that's why Scott was drunk too. Her friend shook his head in disbelief as Anne defended Scott telling Gordo he was probably using the computer to check Lacey's website and to search for updates on the news. She explained that they'd been on the road and Scott hadn't been able to check anything since they'd left Berkeley. Anne knew Gordo was just trying to be a good friend, but he looked at her like she'd lost her mind. She and Scott stayed out drinking at Gordo's until 2 o'clock the next morning, and they both woke up hungover a few hours later. The two of them left early in the morning to visit another friend of Anne's, where Scott had a screwdriver to take off the edge. Afterward, they tried to go to breakfast with Anne's mother, Jerry, Scott's older brother, John, and his wife, Allison, Patrick, who is Jackie Peterson's brother, making him Scott's uncle, and of course, Jackie herself, who lived in Solana Beach, not far from Point Loma. But their family breakfast at Rancho's was cut short after Anne became sick from drinking so much the night before. Anne headed back to her parents' house to rest and nurse her sour stomach, while her mother Jerry took Ryan to the zoo. While they watched the lions pace, Anne's three-year-old son asked his grandma Jerry if she knew that they couldn't find his Aunt Lacey. That night, Scott and Anne went out drinking again, this time after a dinner invitation to the yacht club with Anne's affluent friend, Charlie. Charlie had been out drinking with them the night before, and it seemed the moment Scott saw his Ferrari, he'd taken a shine to Anne's wealthy friend. But it seems Charlie had taken a liking to Scott, too. Dinner at the yacht club and drinks after was at Charlie's invitation, and he made sure to bring his wife along to meet Scott Peterson this time as well. As Scott got looks from people around the room all evening, Charlie and his wife carried on as though they didn't know he was suspected of killing his wife and baby even though they were well aware. Charlie was very conscious of Scott's position when he quietly pulled Anne to one side to remind her that she was lucky, very sincerely explaining how blessed she was to have a brother like him in her life to be close to. She was surprised to hear him say that, considering the angry consensus against her brother at the time, but she thought it was touching and generous of Charlie to give Scott the benefit of the doubt. However, Anne's brotherly feelings quickly faded after the group took another trip back to the Bali High Polynesian Bar, 
for what was supposed to be a single nightcap after dinner. Anne sat with six-month-old Tommy on her lap as they ordered drinks and he'd already begun to fuss. She had opted to take Tommy with her rather than leave him with her mother for a second night in a row. But with three-year-old Ryan still back at her parents' house and knowing they'd worried her mom being out so late the night before, Anne leaned over to remind Scott that they would have to make it an early night. Who cares? He snapped in reply. Anne's anger instantly rose in her face. She'd risked a great deal defending her brother after what he'd done. Even if he hadn't killed her, it certainly made every part of Lacey's nightmare worse with his cheating and his lies. Anne felt instantly betrayed, knowing how carefully she and Tim had been tiptoeing around his feelings, ignoring the elephant in the room with them for weeks. As Scott got up to order more drinks, she calmed herself by soothing Tommy and tried to brush off her irritation. Charlie and his wife still seemed to be enjoying themselves, so Anne took a breath as Scott returned to the table. With four huge tropical drinks, all garnished with fruits and flowers and umbrellas. He passed them around and promptly glued himself back to Charlie. Another round of drinks came and went before Anne reminded Scott again that it was time to go. Who cares about your nine o'clock curfew? No one cares, okay? Less surprised and even more furious with his nasty attitude, Anne's patience wore thin with Scott. By the time she finally convinced him to leave the bar, they were an hour and a half late getting back to the Grady's house, and Jerry had long since tucked Ryan into bed. Anne could tell Scott was still angry with her as they started their drive home early the next morning, but Anne felt she was the one with the right to be angry. And so the two of them barely spoke during the entire nine hour drive back to Berkeley. Once back at the house, Scott showered and told Anne he was leaving. He looked refreshed and handsome, more like the wholesome all-American boy she'd met five years before. Anne said goodbye to her brother, assuming he'd cool down and she'd hear from him soon enough, having no idea that everything would have changed by then. Back in Modesto, Sharon Roaches spent the first week of April celebrating the birth of her new grandson. But while her daughter-in-law, Rose, was in labor, she got a strange call from Detective Grogan. He told her Scott was in Berkeley, which Sharon already knew. But she was surprised to hear him say that he'd called the police on some vandals there after spotting some fresh graffiti. Yeah, right, Mr. Citizen, she muttered sarcastically. But Scott also complained about harassment from the Modesto Police Department to the officers that take his report in Berkeley, which agitated Sharon and Detective Grogan in equal measure. They'd both grown frustrated as Scott walked free and the months wore on, but with so many questions about Lacey and Connor's fate left unresolved, an arrest remained just beyond their reach. However, it wouldn't be long before a shift in the weather marked a dismal but pivotal turn in the tide for them all. On the 12th of April, an ominous storm blew into the San Francisco Bay, rolling and churning the black water with harsh winds and heavy rain. The torrent drudged up agonizing answers from its depths, surrendering its secrets with the surge of a dark tide that followed. The wind held a bit of its clip and the sky remained murky the following day as Michael Luby and his wife ventured out for a walk. They made their way along the coastline in Richmond, hoping to find a nice spot on the beach for their dog to go for a swim. It was late afternoon when they reached what would have been the beach at high tide, but was now a field of mud and debris. Michael commented on how far inland the debris field spread as they walked telling his wife that must have been one heck of a storm. They walked east along the sandy beach, climbing over a small rock wall that marked its end, stepping out onto the marshy mud flat on the other side. They hadn't wandered much farther along the breakwater when something caught Michael's eye, stopping him dead in his tracks and instantly chilling the blood in his veins. He was staring into the tiny lifeless face of an infant Michael moved closer. The baby boy lie in a tidal pool not far from the rocky coastline. A laceration ran from the right shoulder to the torso, 
and his skin was a shade of white that only death could produce. But otherwise, he closely resembled a healthy newborn boy. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode and want to hear more stories like these, give it a like and subscribe to the channel before you go. Don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments and check out our website and social media links down below. As always, until next time, stay safe, be kind, and memento mori.